What's up, everybody? This is Dr. Nick with Leverage Media, and welcome to another episode of Path to a Million Podcast. This one is a, uh, a really special one for me. I've got one of uh, the earliest mentors that, that I had in practice, Dr. Patrick Gentempo here as a guest. Uh, Dr. Patrick, please uh, say hello to the, to the people. Great to be with you here. Hello, and uh, thanks for having me, Nick. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I am as well. Um, so when I first started out in practice, um, didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, bought a practice uh, that I was associated in. It was just like a single room, uh, thousand dollar a month overhead. Uh, it was it was profitable, um, but I didn't. I like wanted to grow it into something bigger, and uh, so I took out a loan. And the two things that I that I uh, took the loan out for was number one, the practice, and number two. A subluxation station. So I got like the, 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 I can't remember if it was called the millennium or I can't remember what it was called, but millennium was I, one I, of them. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. So I, I bought the practice for $47,000 and I got the loan for 60 so that I could buy the subluxation station. So uh, I bought you that, that smart in that young. <laughs> What's that? I said, how were you that smart that young? <laughs> so uh, I don't even know like how I even knew about it, but I, who knows? So anyway, I, um, uh, you know, when you bought the subluxation station, you went to uh, Total, what was it called? Solution, Total Solutions. Total Solutions in Colorado. I'd never been to like a, a chiropractic uh, seminar before. And it was like three days up in the mountains. You learned how to use the, the technology, but you like learned about like philosophy and they had great speakers there. I met Dave Major there who totally changed my life because he taught me how to do spinal screenings. It was just like a, it, it was just, it was probably the impact that you wanted people to have, or you wanted the event to have on, on doctors, especially new in practice. And I will say that that is probably one of the seminal moments in my career of like really putting me on, on a trajectory towards where I am today. So I appreciate all the hard work you put into that and, uh, and putting that together for, for all of us. Well, thanks for those comments. Very nostalgic for me. Uh, you know, yeah. when I was, um, running CLA, uh, I guess during my stay there, it was, we did, I think we ran over a hundred total solution programs. I think we put over 60, 600 chiropractors through it. And, yep. uh, it, you know, the results were pretty spectacular. It was a little bit of a Trojan horse. You know, most people thought they were coming out to learn how to use the technology. And that was really only about 20% of, yep. uh, of the whole thing. Uh, 80% of it was all the other stuff you're talking about. Yeah, because right. what I found out, and it's very relevant to this conversation, if, if, uh, if, if you want to talk about the path to a million dollar practice and how to get there, um, mm -hmm. I could tell you pretty quickly, my point of view is you're asking the wrong question. If you're asking, what do I need to do? Really the question you have to ask is who do you need to be? And, right. and the whole reason we created Total Solution was because I recognized pretty quickly, it wasn't the technology that got the result. It's who the person is using the technology that gets the results. So we had to go work on the things you talked about, their, their uh, psychology, their self-esteem. Uh, a lot of uh, procedural things, you know, what I call the five P's to prosperity, uh, but to understand their philosophy, their purpose, their psychology and their procedure and how that leads to the effect called prosperity. So uh, that's what that was all about. And uh, you were smart to get in it young. <laughs> I, yeah, I, uh, I, I would, at that point, I think I would have bought anything that you were selling because I was just like, man, I resonate with this guy uh, 100%. I became a creating wellness center at that, that event. Like I signed up. Like I didn't even have a, oh, this is, this is actually good. I didn't even have a practice. I, so I, I, bought, I bought the practice, but I, I wanted to open a second practice. That Total Solutions, I forgot this, that Total Solutions was what made me open a second practice, which ended up leading to a heart attack. And it was a terrible idea to start to a second practice, but, but it, it led to where we are today. So that's good. Um, but I loved the idea of creating wellness so much. Um, and it was like a practice model and, you know, so that you could do more than just chiropractic in the office that I, 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 I said yes to it without anywhere to put it. And, and then I created an office to put it into so that was that was how much i believed in what you were what you were talking about that that weekend 
Well, now I know you're a true entrepreneur because that's exactly the type of bizarre behavior entrepreneurs express that others don't. <laughs> so I appreciate the confidence. And you know, you like like you, I, I got so caught up uh, in the vision and the concept of that, and that's a positive thing, not a negative thing to be caught up in it. You know, it was just yeah. really seeing it, and uh, and that was a you know major project, a you know multi multi million dollar investment, and and. Uh, something that we really believed is, uh, the, was the foundation for the concept of chiropractic as a lifestyle um, and not just the treatment of back and neck pain. And uh, you know, so that's what that was all about. So I'm, I'm glad that you, uh, that you, you know, got that excited about it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I like, I'm, well, I'm, now I'm, I'm now saying I'm buying it. I don't even know where I'm putting it, but I'm buying it. A hundred percent. I was, I was all in. Uh, but now I, I'm an eight weeks to wellness office, which, which I think is, is kind of like a, almost like an evolution of, of that model. And so without that creating wellness experience, I may not have uh, had the wherewithal to, to, to open the eight weeks to wellness uh, center because it's, you know, now I've got 5,200 square feet and it's, it's a big undertaking. Um, but the creating wellness center uh, model really like gave me the foundation and the love for the changes that we were making with the people that we put through the program. Well, I think the evidence that it was really about the vision and the mission um, and not just a business opportunity, at least for me, was, uh, you know, I, I took, you know, I spent a lot of hours with Dane Donahue when he was developing Eight Weeks to Wellness and basically yeah. opened up our whole playbook and explained how I think this needs to get done. And, and you know, he had a lot of questions, especially at the time in the beginning, uh, as far as you know, sort of what paths to take on, on constructing a business model around this. And uh, I, I'd like to say that um, I think that I, I helped uh, steer him in a lot of right directions and, and helped, you know, uh, eight weeks to wellness because it was uh, a different but similar business as far as what he was trying yeah. to accomplish and what his vision was. Um, mm -hmm. Much more capital intensive and space intensive, et cetera, for putting up, you know, his systems. But in the end, rather than going and saying, hey, you know, I'm, we're, we're going to hold close to the best here. I just wanted to see him do well. I wanted to see everybody do well because I really believe this was the right direction for the profession. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, again, every, no matter the ups or the downs along the way, you end up where you end up and they're all uh, part of that, that, that journey. So, um, so that was just, that was, I don't know if that had any value for anyone listening, but that was just a, a fun little, I'd forgotten that I bought creating wellness uh, <laughs> without having to practice to put it in. But so anyway, all right. So I told you uh, before this, I don't want to spend, too much time with like the, give me the advice for this level, just because I, this is kind of almost a selfish interview for me. And I'm hoping someone, other people will like get some value out of it, but you're doing so much stuff right now that I think that um, I like, there's just so many like valuable questions that I have for you. I hope they're valuable um, on some of the things that you're doing now and some of the insights, just cause you're, you're really like playing at a higher level um, than, than most of us in that are, that are still in, you know, the chiropractic, um, space exclusively. And so, uh, so let's get into the, the path to a million. Um, you had a practice, you call it, you're in act three right now of your career, correct? Yeah. So yeah. we've got act one is your practice. Act two is CLA. Act three is now action potential holdings, correct? Correct. All right. So and, and, and some one, might say that uh, revealed films is sort of an act four because, uh, uh, it's so, it's such a bizarre departure from my normal business activities, uh, right, but, right. but but it really is one of the holdings in action potential holdings. So I guess you could say it's Act Three, but it really is sort of its own animal. It's becoming big enough to where it's its own thing. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk talk about your practice and just like your insight that you've gotten from working with you know basically like tens of thousands of doctors at this point. Mm -hmm. um, the zero to 250 mark, when you started out in your practice, what were the things that really allowed you to grow to that level? And then what is it that you uh, see from younger doctors that really accelerate through that now? So, um, you know, and this is contextually because, uh, you know, when I started practice, it was the 1980s. Um, so, yeah. you know, what $250,000 was then is very different than what $250,000 is well, now. You, know, it <laughs> was, you have to kind of adjust for inflation for, for you know, th these decades. But nonetheless, um, 
you know, uh, you know, going from zero to 250 is, uh, is a milestone. And I think it's still, you pick kind of the right milestone. Uh, so if the, if the question is, how do you get there? Um, I, you know, in the beginning, you are very much the motive force of, you know, of creating this business. It, it has to, you know, there's the old adage that, you know, 90% uh, of the fuel is, is burned getting a rocket off the launch pad. Then once it lifts off, you know, it takes much less energy to keep it going and to move it out into space. There's less friction, less resistance. And as you move further and further away from gravity that's trying to pull it down, then you've got a lot more, um, uh, it takes a lot less energy or the business term I would use is leverage. You have a lot more leverage to make things happen. So this is, um, but there are things that I don't care if you are a new practice, if you're 250, 500, you break a million, there are fundamentals that I believe uh, are there through the entire journey. And, and the fundamentals are your values and your purpose. That's what's gonna launch a practice. The problem I think that a lot of people have is they're chasing opportunity rather than driving with purpose. So what happens is you start out in a practice, you uh, are in, in the hierarchy of needs, you're really in that survival level, you got bills to pay, unless you're independently wealthy, you come from a wealthy family, but I'm gonna assume that that's not most of us, it certainly wasn't me. So what happens right. is that you, you start with this, um, you know, this idea that I have to go, um, you know, I have this practice I need to develop, I need to build it, et cetera, you got the business side of it, you got the clinical side of it. Um, there's a lot of challenge in the sense that when you lack experience and business experience and how to make business decisions and so on, that you know, that's sort of a handicap in trying to uh, succeed. So what I believe really needs to happen is that uh, the first thing you have to do is just decide what are the values of this practice? And there's no one right set you have to find what your values are, what aligns with your values, what you choose to be those values are. And that's why I've, I've taught philosophy so extensively for so long because the values come from your philosophy. And if you don't know and understand philosophy, then there's no way to really to get zeroed in on your values and assemble them, these core values. And then what emerges out of those core values is this thing called your purpose. And that's what drives everything forward. It's, it's, it's a, uh, um, it's all about uh, saying that I have rocket fuel, to go back to the other analogy, the purpose is really the rocket fuel that lifts the rocket up. <clears throat> so yeah. when you don't have that, you start making knee-jerk reactions. You're bouncing off the guardrails. Um, you, oh, you had a slow week. Maybe we should do this. Oh, we had, you know, that didn't work. Maybe we had, and you're having all these mm -hmm. knee-jerks back and forth. <clears throat> Excuse me, you're um, spending time and money, you're running down blind alleys. There's no clear vision. So the idea in my mind is that before you even open a practice, you should get clear on what its values are, what your philosophy is, what the values are, and what the purpose of that practice is. Yeah. Um, when you said, when you started talking about philosophy, I remember now, like all of these memories are coming back now talking to you. I, I feel like you had the original chiropractic podcast. Dude, I used on to purpose? listen to you. Yeah, I used to listen to on purpose on just a loop. I mean, I was, I had, I still have boxes of those yellow CD containers. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of money for a lot of things uh, when I first started out, but that's 79 bucks a month or whatever it was. That was, that was, I felt good about that one. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, I think it was actually 50, like 49 a month or something. Uh, but you paid quarterly you, back then, at least. Uh, you, do you know we're yeah. still doing that? Um, I did still, not know. I need to get still, back on that. <laughs> it's still, you know, so Dr. Kent really, you know, organized and runs it every month, but I still get, get on with him every month and, and I co-host the, uh, the science and the politics program. So we started that in 1994. It's still going. <laughs> so that's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, it really is. Uh, and, and, and that's really, you know, if you could think about it, I think about all these years ago, you know, some of the fundamentals have never changed for me. Uh, I, I came up with this concept and called it on purpose because I said success doesn't happen by accident. It happens on purpose. Yeah. And when you're getting clarity around your purpose and, uh, and you know, uh, putting that on the ground and, and actualizing it, that's where success really comes from. And you could have 10 different practices that have 10 different purposes 
Um, yeah. But they can all become very successful based on that. So, um, you know, it kind of circles back to the, hopefully the point I made earlier is that when you aren't clear on your purpose, like if I were, if you're listening to this or watching this right now, and I were to say to you, what's the purpose of your practice? How compelling and immediate an answer do you have? And if you don't have an immediate and compelling answer, then you don't have enough clarity around this. And if you don't have enough clarity around it, then that's, that's going to translate into struggle and lack of performance. So that's why these yeah. things, and that's why I said, it's not a matter of you need to do this procedure, you need to do that procedure. I'm asking you, who do you need to be? What is your, you know, what is, yeah. the, what is the soul of this practice? What does it exist for? And I will say that the, the purpose of the practice and your purpose are not the same thing. I, when I sold right. my practice, I sold my practice in 1991. It's still in the same town serving the same community this many years later. Because if, if the practice was just my purpose, then when I left, the practice would have died. But right. instead, I gave birth to a practice, so I imposed my values and my own purpose on it. But it has to stand independently as its own entity so that if I leave, I always call it getting hit by the truck uh, you know, a metaphor, which my wife doesn't like too much. But if I get hit by a truck, <laughs> does this practice keep going is really the question. Right. And, um, and, and, or this business, whatever the business is, but we were talking about practices, um, then, yep. uh, you know, then that's the way I want to see it happen. The CLA, I sold uh, nine, 10 years ago. CLA is still out there, still serving professions, still evolving its technology, et cetera. So, you know, it's what I'm passionate about in, in the business side of things is making sure that I'm creating businesses that don't die with me, but continue to serve a purpose in the realms that they exist. And, uh, and I think that that's one key to building, you know, big businesses or legacy businesses. And I, you know, uh, uh, a guy that, that we both love, uh, uh, Stephen Franson, you know, that's what he's really trying to impart in his CEO group. It's, it's that, you know, a, a business has to be, you know, scalable, durable, and transferable. Like there are too many practices that die with either the doctor's life or the doctor's career in those communities are who get hurt. Those chiropractic patients that their doctor retires and nobody buys it and they just stop getting chiropractic care versus like going and finding someone else because that was the place that they went. So um, I really believe in that, in that a lot. Um, all right. So the next stage, you know, somebody's at around 20,000 a month. Uh, they've kind of figured some stuff out. They've got some systems in place. So going from that 250 to 500 a year mark, uh, what's the, what, what should they be focused on there? So one of the things I would say, incidentally, um, we're, we're using as our, our yardstick um, monthly revenue um, or annual revenue. Uh, annual, yeah. called, you know, revenue, would, yeah, just it's called revenue. So, sure. um, and, but I would tell you that a practice that has a low overhead that's, that's, um, that's uh, purely cash-based, meaning they accept no insurance assignment, that um, you know runs very efficiently um, mm -hmm. and is collecting twenty thousand dollars a month to me is a very different practice that's got a higher overhead, lots of insurance dependency, and is collecting twenty thousand dollars a month. So uh, they yeah. you know, so we can we can certainly talk in terms of of, of revenue, and, but I have to just give the caveat that um, revenue isn't the only thing that matters, especially for valuing a business. Um, you know, if, if I have a, a practice that sees uh, um, 300 visits a week, or let's call it 1,200 visits a month, yeah. um, and that practice has a, what I call a DPA, a different patient average of 1,000, meaning that out of those 1,200 visits, that's 1,000 different people. Yeah. That's a very different business than a 1,200 uh, visit a month practice that has 300 different people. You know, I saw, yeah. you know, saw 300 different people 400, four times as compared to yeah. almost you know, 1.2 times per person. So mm -hmm. these are, there's varying levels of maturity in a practice, varying levels of you know, where the income comes from, what it takes to create that income. So uh, since we're talking, and, and so I'll get to this because I know you're framing it from zero to 50. Classic, cla classic, gen classic gen tempo trying to disrupt the structure of my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a disruptor, man. I mean, that's, uh, I forget which Cairo magazine it was, but it had a picture of me on the front saying disruptor. So I, 
I, I don't, I never looked at myself that way, but I guess it's what I am, uh, at least in part. Uh, so I, so it brings it to yeah. mind because I literally just had this conversation this morning in my philosophy formula group. I, I have like this, this group that I meet with once a month um, that took my philosophy formula course. And um, there's one guy in the group uh, who I'll call Dave, you know, I'm, yeah, I don't know if, I, if, uh, yeah, if I'm allowed to talk about publicly, but it was interesting because the conversation that we're having was around the distinction between being unattached to outcomes and being indifferent uh, and they're really different things. And so I came to find out because I'm, I'm getting ready to release a book and I realized I was unattached to the outcome, but that unattachment became indifference because I don't really depend on it for income or money or anything. It's just, I want to get these ideas in the world. And, but, but I actually started to get like, I wasn't acting upon it because I became somewhat indifferent. Um, and I said, oh, wait a minute, no, I'm supposed to be unattached, but that, I don't want to be indifferent. I really care about this. I love this thing. I want to put some energy behind it. And then whatever happens, happens. I won't, I'm not going to let my joy in life be attached to, you know, a certain number of books that sold. So anyway, um, in, in this particular case, this guy, Dave, and it's germane to this conversation. You'll see why in a moment. Mm -hmm. He is a guy now that is practicing himself two days a week. He's more profitable than he's ever been. He's having more fun than he's ever had. Um, and, uh, and the practice keeps growing. I, I think he's got associates maybe on, on some of the other days or one, you know, or he's got one associate maybe on other days, but his own activity is two days a week, but he hits it hard and he's just loving it. So here's what he said though. He said, my frustration, he said, what's so crazy is that I strove to have a million dollar practice. That was his target. And he was pushing up toward there. Big, you know, lots of overhead, lots of activity, a couple of associates, staff coming, going, et cetera. And just really going through the marks of going from 250 to, over, to 500 to over 500 and moving up in, in the trajectory that you're uh, you know, describing here. And he yeah. said, then what happened though, is he, he started sort of busting at the seams. He sort of, um, he injured his shoulder so he couldn't adjust as much and it was holding him back. And, and he finally got to the, you know, the screw it point, you know, because uh, he, was, he was wealthy enough. I mean, he had made enough money, he's doing okay. Where he said, I'm simplifying, getting rid of almost everybody, cutting things down. I'm going to practice two days a week. And lo and behold, his practice has actually grown to new heights. He's working a lot less. He's simplified. His profitability is much more. So what's the point I'm making? I find <clears throat> that many times when we're aiming at pushing revenue and our drive is on that side of things and we're not mindful of our own personal values, quality of life, the type of life we want to live, et cetera, that we can get lost and the consequence of which is you might push up revenue, but you, know, you're, you end up uh, debilitating yourself. I heard you say heart attack earlier. Stuff can yeah. happen when, you're, when, you're not, when the wrong things are driving you toward certain goals. So, um, so when we're looking at the 250 to 500, I think at that point, that's one of the inflection points where you have to learn to hire well. Uh, pretty much, I think any good chiropractic entrepreneur can get to 250, almost carrying the whole thing on their back with some support staff around them. But that's yeah. unsustainable. Um, you, you know, a, a quick little caveat uh, from my own history past when I was in practice. When I was um, roughly around, you know, and this is 1983, but I was probably you know, over 250,000 in my practice, which would be a, a bigger number now. But uh, I remember yeah. sitting one day at the end of the year saying, okay, what's my goal for next year? And I said, we're going to double that practice. I want to double. And I literally had the immediate thought, I'll die. If I took my energy output of what it took me to get here and said, I'm going to now try to double, it would crush me. It would. And then I had to go back and say, okay, well, why would that be? I, should, I, mean, I was a young guy. I was in my mid-20s. I, I had lots of good energy. It's like, how did, how did that thought strike me? And I realized that there were many answers, but ultimately, what was the end? Where's my biggest energy expenditure? And it, what, you know, for you who are watching right now, uh, you're going to be hearing things that you're probably not going to hear in other places relative to how I see this. I, I usually do see things a little differently. And a lot of times it's going to, you know, what, what, you know, the answer is going to be, um, uh, 
multitudes of process, procedure, et cetera, which wouldn't be untrue as far as how to get past this. But what I recognize for myself is that there, I had to go back and say, where is my most of my energy being spent? And it's not just a matter of, can you get leverage with more employees and work less hours? That's what most people would tell you. But I can tell you that when I was in the zone and I was spending hours in that zone doing what I did, I had more energy at the end, not less. Mm -hmm. So where was the energy leaking that was, that was draining out of me? Uh, and it wasn't just a fact of hours. I, I love putting in hours. I, 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 when I was transitioning from practice into CLA and I had both for a while, I worked about four and a half years, seven days a week and loved every minute of it. But I was also in my 20s and I also was unmarried. And I also didn't have kids. And that's just what I wanted to do in my life at that point. Yeah. What I discovered was a contradiction that was draining me. And this was the contradiction. My contradiction is that I felt like I was selling a product I wasn't sure I was delivering. Hmm. I was really good at having the energy to look you in the eye and say, uh, you know, uh, here's your care plan, you know, talk to you about subluxations and what chiropractic can do for you. And really like kind of like push it, push it, push it. And, I, and, and on the philosophical side, I was bought in 110%. But then I realized that in my report of findings, you know, I'm reporting my orthopedic tests, my neurological, the, the medicals. And I realized that what my vision was for the patient and what I was selling them and what I was really in any kind of a quantitative way delivering were two different things. And that disconnect caused me to feel like I had to push more and convince people. So con convincing people to do stuff is maybe the most exhausting thing there is out there. You know, if we have to really convince you. So every time, every yeah. patient, every, the volume, I had to keep the volume, I had to convince more people about how it was right. And that's why the insight was born, quite frankly, is I, in, out, of that, out of that experience saying, well, how do I measure what it is I'm looking to do with this patient? That's what became important. So it, it was, a, it was a, a life change for me. It was an inflection point. Uh, where my practice was at that, you know, at one level, which was, you know, eclipsing, you know, that 250 mark, somewhere between the 250 and 500. And, and then realizing mm -hmm. that trying to take what I was doing at that point in time and grow it to the next level was, would, would crush me. So I had to sort yeah. those things out. And once I did, it did actually move to the next level. It did start to continue to grow. Um, another point that I want to make about this is that, and this is the scary part, um, typically, and this will be true of the milestone, you know, 250 to 500, this is true of the milestone 500, you know, 750 a million, is that there are these yeah. sort of inflection points where you have to reorganize to be able to grow to a higher level. You can't sustain. Yeah. So what happens if you look at the stock market is, I think you can see my head. So if the stock market, if you're watching a stock and it's gonna be going like this, Stocks never continue just to keep going like this forever, right? Right. What happens is it goes up and then there's a correction, they call it. And then it goes to the next level and then there's another correction. So the line going up is like this. And quite frankly, going down is the same too. So yeah. we call that area where it starts to move down to correct a squat, meaning you're reorganizing, resetting. And when you're going through the transition, usually there's a bit of a squat because, and why is it called a squat? Because before you can jump up, you have to do what? You have to squat down and then you can jump to the next level. It's true metaphorically for the business also. So, yeah. um, so why I say that is that very often chiropractors will panic when they go into a squat. They, you know, they, they built a level. Now they're going to have to change some things, reorganize some things. And, before, mm -hmm. and, and as they do that, they see the practice dip. And when the practice dips, yeah. they freak out and then they go back to old behaviors and it keeps them stuck yeah. at that one level. So, so don't yeah. be afraid of the squat when you're, get, when you're reorganizing to go to the next level. And I guess to fully answer the question, um, you know, to me, 250 to 500 now is about staff and systems. You're, mm -hmm. you're, getting, you're kind of shrugging off, uh, you know, everything that you carried. And now you have to gain leverage through staff and systems to keep this going uh, to that next level. Um, this is why I need to get back. 
uh, into on purpose is because, or get back on purpose is because uh, squat and the rocket launch. I mean, this is why I loved listening to you guys. You always have like the best, that squat is, I've never thought of it that way, but that does happen when you like get to that level, things start to break and you're like, okay, you start to learn the new systems or make the new decisions. And it does dip before it starts to go back up. And the only way that you allow it to go back up is if you're like, again, if you have that purpose, if you have that vision of where you're going to go. Speaking of the stock market, I just looked it up. Uh, we are in, we've lost 870 points today. So my girlfriend and I closed on a house on Friday. And this is the week of like the coronavirus uh, correction. And uh, we, we closed on our house on, on Friday morning. It's our first house that we purchased together. And uh, since we closed, it's lost 3,000 points. So like, I don't know if, I don't know if maybe it's the coronavirus or it was us making a huge financial decision that, that caused the stock market to just crash. But, you know, uh, uh, so yeah, we are in a squad for sure right now. <laughs> you, 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 you are, you're actually talking about something quite relevant. Um, maybe unwittingly, but, but it, it's there is that um, the stock market and this is, you know, you know that we've done docu series on money and, and markets and so on. And we're about to do it. We're in the middle of another one, actually, a release called Wealth Breakthroughs. It is uncanny to me how psychological the market is and how people panic, sell off, do stuff. And these are really, I mean, you know, because you're talking about what moves the markets are these big institutional investors and, you know, people who are very sophisticated. And yet, uh, things like a, a virus, you know, it's going to suddenly cause this hysterical sell. I'm probably going to go buy some more equities now after we hang up because you, I, I wasn't even looking at the market today. I have money in the market, <laughs> but it's like, um, yeah. you know, hey, if, if everybody's going to panic and sell, that's the best time to buy. So, uh, so right. it's, it's, but, but the point is the psychology, right? The point yes. is, how people start to panic, start to do this, start to do that. And, and, and as you can see for me, I'm not, I, I didn't, I was, you know, I was working in my purpose. I was, I didn't even look at the market, you know, cause it's yeah. gonna, whatever's happening is happening. I don't get psychologically tied up in it. And, and for this sure. is true of the practice. If the practice starts to pull back, as long as you have a vision of the future, as you, as you uh, noted, you know, Nick, the, the, the purpose, Hey, you're going to go through ups and downs through all the years of this career that you have. And, uh, and certainly you don't want to be indifferent to them, <laughs> but at the same time, you don't want to be attached to day by day, what the numbers are. You have goals. You want to push towards those goals. That's fantastic. And it, when, when things pull back a little bit, don't freak out. And, and the old adage that level heads prevail is correct. The people that, that, again, that's the knee jerk reactions because if there's no purpose, if there's no values, you start then looking at range in the moment decisions because of what's going on as compared to mm -hmm. saying the purpose is in this, I got a compass setting, it's called my true north. The purpose is in that direction. I'm gonna have numbers yeah. going up and down along the way, but I'm staying the course because I know where I'm going. Absolutely. So on these last, I kind of want to change up the way that we do these last two levels. Mm -hmm. So UAC is a mastermind that, that you started a while ago. I'm now a part of. Um, and in order to be considered as a member, you have to be collecting over $500,000 in your practice. And so I want to, you, you've just had a lot of exposure to people basically 500000 and above. So I want to get your insight on what is it, what is different about the people that get stuck in that five hundred to a million range and the ones that break through to the million. What's, what, what do you see? You know, it, it's, it's almost too trite, but it's their headspace. Um, it really mm -hmm. is. And, um, and you're right in the sense of, you know, the, the minimum entry point is half a million. We have many multi-million dollar practices in there also. So we get, I get to see the mix. And I've also, because we've been doing UAC now for I think 11 or 12 years, um, I also have been able to watch people in that 500 to a million range get stuck there and be frustrated there and then mm -hmm. also watch them break through it at a point in time. Yeah. And so the question is, you know, that you're asking, at least in my mind is, so why do they get stuck or what is it that the stuck people finally notice that gets them to break through? Yeah. 
So I'm going to give a couple of uh, comments on this. Number one, this is where your self-image or your sense of identity comes in. I'm going to say this is maybe the most prevalent one. Many people find themselves because they're just good in certain ways or many ways that, wow, they broke through a half million dollar, between a half million and a million dollar practice and, they were, mm -hmm. and, and they're, they're grateful for it, et cetera. But there's a little voice that they don't even hear. It's out of their audible zone, but it's a little voice inside basically saying to them, what do you think you're doing? You, you're not this. You, you know, they don't have the self-image or the, the perception that they could be making the kind of money they're making, enjoying the kind of lifestyle that they're enjoying. And as a result, what we, our self-image, our sense of identity is always, I'm not, it's not even 99% of the time. When, if we if let it play out long enough, 100% of the time it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I believe that the thing that breaks them through is when they literally, and you have power and domain over this, literally change your sense of self, your self-perception, and your sense of identity. When that happens, now a whole new world opens up to you. Because it's, it's really interesting, there's, there's a thing in human psychology called confirmation bias, where we're always looking to you know, confirm whatever biases we have. And if we have unspoken biases relative to who we are, what we're capable of, what we were told, what our mothers, fathers, teachers, preachers told us growing up, then we're gonna, we're gonna live into that. It's gonna play out over time. And that, that might mean, because what I have seen, and I'm sure you have too, are people who are doing you know, great, you know, half a million plus practice, they're in a good trajectory. Next thing you know, they blow up. Yeah. Why did it blow up? And they'll have all kinds of reasons. Well, I got divorced and, you know, I had to split it with my spouse and, you know, that took the whole thing down and put me in a funk or I had, they'll, they'll see many, many different external things occur that they can mm -hmm. legitimately point at that adversely impacted their growth and development and success. But I know that those things all happen because of some sense of identity and a self-fulfilling prophecy and that these things you know end up degenerating to to mm -hmm. those uh scenarios now what i've seen on the other side is people who went to work on themselves who said okay we've gotten to this level and that's why i keep asking the question don't ask me what to do to get from five hundred thousand to a million ask me who you need to be to get from 500,000 to a million in your practice. Because mm -hmm. once you know who to be, what to do comes naturally, it really does. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that, there, that the do part of it's not important, but it's secondary. It's definitely secondary. So I have seen, and this, and you bring up UAC, and this is uh, you know, one premise that I uh, subscribe to, um, in, in one view of reality, is that you are like the five people you hang out with most. So what do I see? I see the people mm -hmm. who show up at UAC who are at 500,000 hanging around with people in million dollar plus practices. What, what's gonna happen? You can't help but stretch yourself up there, recast your thinking. Being around those people, you start to feel like, oh, I belong here. I'm routinely, I'm pretty much the least successful person that I hang out with. I mean, the people I hang out with are, are you know, from a, business financial standpoint for the most part, not 100%, but for the most part, um, are much more successful than I am. Um, but I'm, you know, but we, we are valuable to each other in our dynamics. And so my head is always stretched toward these things of what's possible, because I didn't grow up with money. I didn't grow up with wealth. So it wasn't like an automatic thing to, to feel like this needs to be around me. So I, I really, I mean, certainly there are business things. Like I, you know, when I look at it, you know, I, and I just had this conversation uh, yesterday with some people as we we're looking at businesses. And, you know, I, you know, multiple times in my career, I've moved through different milestones of hitting the million dollar mark, hitting the $5 million mark, hitting the $10 million mark. And what happens, I see the inflection points you're talking about. And I know that, you know, one of them comes usually around a million. One of them usually comes around that five million. Sometimes it's three, but normally about five million, et cetera, where there has to be more organizational structure, more rigidity, different organizational chart. I mean, I can get into how the, uh, the business looks from those structural standpoints at different milestones. But always, it, you know, the mindset is the thing that's going to open up your awareness to these things and, and self-destruction and sabotage is to me the number one 
death threat and the number one enemy to somebody trying to get from 500 to a million. Yeah. I, uh, I really, uh, I believe what you're talking about with the, uh, the UAC stuff, like just being around more successful people, you know, that's why, you know, we have accountability groups inside of it. And that's why they're so important. Like my accountability group is Fred Domenico, Brian Capra and Pete Martoni. And I mean, other than Pete Martoni, you know, that's a really good uh, accountability group that really like, <laughs> I got, I got news Tell for you. Stuff your game up, you know. <laughs> I got. I love to make fun of Pete, but I got news for you. Um, Pete is is so he's a guy that's been in UAC since the beginning. Yeah. Um, he's a guy that you know started at the minimum level to get into UAC. He's doing yeah. things now that are staggering, and just keep an eye on that guy because his head and and he he is my poster child for how self image you know, uh, you, you know, you play into that and it keeps you low, but he kept showing up and now he's really transformed, I believe his self image and what he believes is possible in his life. And I think he's going to go big. I remember he just texted me yesterday, he just got called back from Shark Tank on his pillow, you know, and I think yeah. he's going to get on Shark Tank. I think this thing is going to, it's going to explode and you're going to see him blow up really, really big. Yeah, as I I just like to kid Pete Martoni like probably about as much as you do. Uh, yeah, he, nobody likes to uh, kid. Nobody likes doing, to do it more than me. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. He uh, he is every week. It's like he's connecting with somebody else. It's just massive. Like it's just it's but it's just awesome to like see that as a reality. You know, and that's the part of of those accountability groups and like just being around people that are just doing really big things. And, um, and so I, I love that you put that together because I joined about a year and a half ago and it's been, you know, again, one of those like seminal moments for me in my career, especially with this iteration, my act too. Um, mm -hmm. It's really made a big difference in, in, in that. So, um, so I appreciate that. That's awesome. All right. Um, so go ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, and I, I was just going to say that um, accountability, I think is a big part of, of success. Uh, and one other, you know, being that you have other people you're accountable to that are your peers that are operating at the level at least that you are. Um, that was, that, that's something that had, has had massive impact on my life for, for, you know, the past several years. And then the second thing I would say is that, um, uh, and you started to cite this, but it's, it's a real big clue. Um, I think if you're going to get from 500,000 to a million, you're going to have to know what your strengths are. You don't get there mm -hmm. on your weaknesses. Yeah. And, and so like Pete, Pete has a laundry list of weaknesses, but his strengths as far as connecting and as yeah. far as, you know, uh, you know, making connections, nurturing his connections and blowing it up and asking for things. You know, he was at a, a event, a, a marketing mastermind that I went to. He was there a year ago. And somebody said, okay, ask for an unreasonable thing. So he stood right up. He said, I want to meet Tony Robbins. Well, you know, lo and behold, two weeks ago, he texted me. He's at Tony Robbins house, you know, adjusting yeah. him. So, uh, so you know, the details are important. It's just the fact that he knows how to network, connect, and leverages that for all it's worth. That's he's ten times better at that stuff than I am. Um, and uh, so that that's how he makes his success happen. You know, I, I have different strengths, so I do it differently. Yeah, I hate that we spent ten percent talking about how great Pete is, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. So one question that I think you'd have in, interesting insight on is I believe that, or, well, I think this is just like a fact at this point. What is your thought on, I feel like the best entrepreneurs in chiropractic do not like once they like figure it out, right. They really like crush it in practice. They all tend, and I, not all, but 95% of them tend to then pivot to something that is not continuing to see patients or continuing to like grow practices. Do you feel like the best entrepreneurs make it to a certain level and then pivot out of like the, the treating of patients or having patients treated under their, you know, umbrella? And if so, like, why do you think that is? I think the short answer is yes. Um, and I think it is uh, because they have a sense of identity that goes beyond um, being a, you know, a, a technician or a doctor that's treating all the time, or you know, that's that's, you know, uh, restricting their activities to patient care. They, a, a real entrepreneurs always are are looking for ways to scale. They're looking for ways yeah. to 
create more scale and efficiency. Now, that doesn't mean that they're doing non-chiropractic things. You know, like, you know, Joe Esposito, he's got a franchise of 35 chiropractic offices. Uh, yep. There's other people there who develop, you know, Brian Copper, he says, you're, you're software companies. Um, and you, you see other chiropractors who, um, who maybe open up multiple practices that are all corporate owned. Uh, there, you know, there's, there's so many directions they can and, and do go into, uh, but typically, you, when you are the only um, uh, doctor providing care in an office, um, you're going to hit a ceiling at some point in time that you just can't leverage anymore. So that means that now you have to go from kind of the, from uh, chiropractic, uh, chiropractor technician, you know, doctory stuff to yeah. um, to now saying I'm going to be a um, you know, more of a CEO of a, of an entity that we're going to run like a business. And that's also yeah. something that has to happen to get to a million. Well, I, I think I mean more of like why there aren't more people like Joe that takes what he learns in one clinic and then uses multiple clinics as the, 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 um, the itch to scratch and for an entrepreneur. Whereas I just feel like that's maybe the 5%, like the Stu Bernsons, the Joe Espositos of the world, they're out there like creating more opportunities for people to get chiropractic. Um, I just, the other 95%, me included, you included, um, pivot to something that's not of, of uh, treating patients. But I just, that, that's just one thing that I'm always kind of interested in on, on like- Yeah, life, life's a little funny as far as what comes up and, and what, you know, the, the circumstances, you know, that shape you. And, and I think we all can find inflection points, you know, my, my book, which is coming out March 17th, is a reflection of 30 years of, of being an entrepreneur and, and all the stuff I learned. And it, it was an exercise in looking at those inflection points. It's like, okay, if in 1986, if I didn't get hit by a truck and laid up, boy, things wouldn't have went a certain way. If I didn't happen to meet Christopher Kent when I was um, dealing with this struggle in my practice that I talked about earlier as far as selling a product I'm not sure I'm delivering, I don't know that, you know, the tech technology would have emerged, you know, from that. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of this combination of variables that is, you know, a certain inspiration that you might have, a certain vision, certain set of circumstances, many times it's adverse circumstances, and then some other thing that comes up and then boom, you're in a new direction. Um, you know, it's never perfectly planned. You know, the old adage, you know, we make plans and God laughs. I think that's true. Um, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, there's, this, there's that certain sense of, uh, of destiny around a lot of this. Uh, but I will also say that um, very often because somebody is good at one thing, they start to think they're good at another. And that's not, that's not true a lot of times. Meaning, yeah. wow, I built a great practice. I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a phenomenal business person, entrepreneur. And then they go try to get entrepreneurial in some other way and it fails miserably. And I'm not trying to discourage anybody. But I'm not, what I am saying is just because you can build a strong, healthy practice does not automatically equal that you can, you know, do other types of businesses too. Um, I certainly have had my, yeah, I've started over 15, 16 companies. So I've certainly have had my um, share of, uh, of failures along the way. Gotcha. One of the biggest things that I, or a few of the biggest things that I know about you is number one, you love wine. Number yes. two, you love travel. And then number three, you love John Varvato's clothing. And I wore my John Varvato shirt specifically for you for this interview. <laughs> so I don't have any John Varvato's questions, but I have, uh, I, have a, I have three wine questions, three travel questions, and then you can answer as rapidly or as in depth as you want on these. This is uh, great. You, you right. do know me. Good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, on the wine, I want to know what is the, uh, what's the best red? What's the best white? What's the best champagne? Well, so and I know I know that's a very nuanced answer. Yeah, well, it, it's not a nuanced. Let's say yours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there, it, there, there can never be like one. Uh, you know, saying this is the best. I mean, uh, there are there's there's variables as far as you know. Um, you know, what are you eating? Yeah, you know, what are you drinking? Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of things. But if yeah. I were to do it just purely, you know, uh, saying okay pick out my favorites that are in existence. Um, so the best champagne, boy, that's, that's, that's really tough. Uh, 
you know, obviously a lot of people love Dom. I love Dom. I don't think it's the best champagne by a long shot. Cristal, but you know, now you're talking about, you have to say within price points, you know, you know, we can yeah, that's talk true. about bottles that are in the thousands of dollars. Let's say under a hundred dollars. Let's say for all of these, let's say under a hundred dollars. Well, now you're really limiting the field for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since you had an under a hundred dollars. I think bottle. there's probably some, some of the Tattinger champagnes under a hundred bucks are, are really, really good. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, a Moet. I mean, there's, there's, there's several there. Um, the, uh, and I actually have discovered some new sparkling wines. They're not from Champagne, but they're, you know, mm. from uh, French Court to Italy, where I just was recently that I found were really uh, pretty extraordinary at, under, you know, at, at a very reasonable price point. Uh, my favorite red wine, you say, okay, what's my number one favorite red wine in the world? Uh, I'm gonna have to go with Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. It's the first growth out of Bordeaux. I have a good chunk of it in my cellar, but you know, you're talking wines that, you know, uh, usually very much eclipse a thousand dollars a bottle, but uh, so I'm not drinking it every day, but uh, right. there's special occasions. I'm certainly uh, tapping into that. I will tell you that half my cellar or more is Napa wines, but um, so my, my palate has changed quite a bit uh, for, I think a couple of reasons, but uh, I'm really looking more towards old world wines now, uh, the, the French wines, the Italian wines. Um, and uh, we did Wine Revealed uh, not long ago. We, we released that and uh, spent uh, with a film crew a couple of weeks in Italy at a bunch of wineries. That was a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, but I, I'm finding that, you know, that the New World wines, especially like the, you know, the American wines, you know, Australian, uh, South American, uh, South African, uh, these wines, especially on Napa, they're very manipulated in their flavoring. There's a lot of additives in them. I don't feel good after I drink them anymore. So uh, they really are building them for particular palates. They're not letting a representation of the earth, the terroir, the, and, and, and getting, the winemaking practice is getting out of the way and letting the wine express the region as compared to a winemaker enforcing his ego on it. So, uh, so that's a good generalized thing, but, uh, but if you, so to, the short answer to the question is Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, my favorite red wine. Um, but I, I, you know, I, there's so many red wines I enjoy. Um, and and about, on white wines, white? You know, white wines I'm particular to uh, the white burgundies. It's a Chardonnay grape, but it's made old world style. Um, so uh, a Chassagne Montrachet, um, a, a Pellini Montrachet, uh, you know, these are the white wines that, you know, to me are transcendent. Uh, although I will say, so if you, if you want to be cool, like let's say you don't know wine very well and you want to be like cool, like you'd be very hip and people who knew wine would say, wow, you knew about that. Um, there's there's these, uh, a guy named Gravner who we went and visited, I interviewed him. He's in Italy, uh, right on the border of Slovenia. Uh, and he brought back an ancient winemaking practice, which is uh, they could be so-called orange wines. They're kind of amber in color. And uh, it's, it, it's, too, it's a whole other podcast to talk about how the wine is made, et cetera, but it uses white grapes, but the product is kind of orange in, in color. It has a really distinct different type of flavor because of how they put them in these, uh, they call them in fours, but these, these clay pots that they bury under the ground that are huge with the stems, the seeds and everything for a period of time and then extract them. It's, a, it's, a, it's thousands of years old winemaking practice and it creates this orange wine and they are absolutely spectacular. They're very, very different, unusual, and people usually either love them or hate them. But if you knew about orange wines, you'd be a very cool person. Well, that's all I'm ever looking for when it comes to wine. <laughs> so I, I also, I do feel cool. I have, I've gone to Napa with Patrick Gentempo and I've smoked weed with Billy D. So I feel like I, <laughs> I really covered like <laughs> You're the fun the of chiropractic, now. so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, real quick for, for travel, what I want to know, what's your most interesting place that you've been to most adventurous and most relaxing. Most interesting place I've ever been. Um, the most interesting and the most uh, impactful you said, right? I said interesting, adventurous and relaxing. Oh, adventurous. Okay. So yeah. But interesting, Inter interesting and adventures kind of go together. I'm going to say, uh, you know, my probably the most adventurous trip I took was was um, Egypt. Um, you know, touring, you know, going the, the pyramids of Giza, the Valley of the Kings. I spent five days on a boat in the Nile, um, and it is just breathtaking and extraordinary. And you feel like you left the planet, and it's ancient. It's it, you know, so that was uh, that was probably the most adventurous. Uh, 
the most interesting, uh, and these are hard because I, you know, I do travel around a lot uh, yeah. interesting places, but uh, I'm going to say interesting and maybe most impactful are my trips to Israel. Uh, so Israel is, I think everybody needs to go see Israel at some point. It really is the center of Western civilization. And um, it's, it, it, you know, it, it brought goosebumps to me so many times through that experience. Uh, we took a film crew there for a couple of weeks when we were filming Christ Revealed. Uh, and that's a way to take a trip to Israel without going. Just, just watch that, <laughs> that uh, docuseries and you'll see what I'm talking about. But, um, you know, I always, we become very American centric here uh, in, in America. But when you start to see the cradle of the Western world and how it came out of Israel and, and you're traveling, you know, on all the parts, um, I, I, it's still maybe one of the most life altering trips or the most life altering trip I've ever taken. I've been twice now and uh, brought my kids a second time because after I went the first time, I was like, my kids have to come experience this. Uh, so that, and then the most relaxing, probably, um, well, there's a bunch of those. Uh, I'm going to have to go with uh, where I got married, a little, little Palm Island uh, in the Florida Keys. It's a, it's a small island. You can only get there by boat. Uh, there's only, I think, about 30 people. There's more staff on the island than there are guests, which is kind of fun. Uh, it's very upscale, but um, you, you can't help but get very relaxed there. Great. Um, so you talk, you've mentioned a couple times about the book coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, I love this title for it. You know, I've heard you talk about it before. This is the uh, first and only copy I have at this point. <laughs> but I love it. I like that. I love friend. the... Uh, I love the, that looks like it could be in an airport. Like I love that, uh, yeah. that cover as well. So uh, well, talk a little bit about the book and, and when it's going to be coming out. So what, what I would tell you is, is this, um, uh, you know, I don't make my living as an author or selling books. It's, it's my first book. I finally did a book after all these years. But why I created this book is that there's, as you witnessed it, Total Solution through my career, there's a lot of lectures and presentations that I love, but I don't give anymore. Um, and I don't want the, I didn't want the information to die. And then I started to see how I could assemble it in a book and how it would work where I, I don't have to feel the pressure of, of, you know, documenting it and continue to put it in the world. Uh, a book can do that for me. And I happened to outside of chiropractic, start talking about some of these principles and concepts, uh, you know, the five pieces of prosperity, you know, understanding the five branches of philosophy and applying them practically to business, finding your Miles Davis creative destruction. There's a lot of things in here and that's, uh, you know, and incidentally getting from 500 to a million creative destruction is an absolute element of that. You have to be able to destroy what is to create what isn't yet. Um, and I give examples of all this, uh, but in the end, uh, it turned out, you know, to, to be in this, uh, I put it all together in this book, uh, Hay House, you know, accepted the book proposal. They were very excited about it. So they're publishing the book. Um, and uh, it, the launch date, I don't know when this is gonna be aired, but the publication of the book is March 17th. Um, to me, and you know, I've said this, and I, I'm not saying this with any ego, it's just from experience and knowing what I put into it. Uh, it's the best $19.95 you could possibly ever spend. Uh, if, I, if I look at how much money people paid for all the varying things that I presented in my time and in my life and saying, I have it all in here and more, and it's 19, you know, it's under 20 bucks. It's, it's yeah. kind of like, wow. Um, uh, I really have an appreciation now for books when you're really doing books. In other words, I think a lot of people do vanity pieces and the book, you know, the, the book doesn't really have a lot of substance in it and, and that's mm -hmm. disappointing. But when you have uh, people who literally have, have worked to shape a book based on many years of experience and, and what it takes to organize a thousand times harder than doing a lecture, and what it takes to organize it and make it meaningful and put it into the world and that you get to get this information for under 20 bucks, at least in this case, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those no brainers. Um, you know, you can get it at Amazon or any of the, you know, the retailers. Uh, what I will also tell you is that uh, you might know Joe Polish and his uh, mastermind, which I'm a member of uh, his 25K group. He also has a 100K group where people pay $100,000 a year to be in the room. These are people with very big uh, businesses. They're very wealthy. And he had me come in and give a presentation to the group um, for an hour on your stand as your brand on the concepts of the book. So that's a, that's a hell of a test ground to have people that are really playing at that level. And uh, it was an hour presentation. The, the audience loved it. The questions were very insightful. They're really uh, rewarding questions as far as what they were digging into. And, and they were quite blown away. They said, this is like unlike the typical stuff they get. Uh, but we recorded that. Um, uh, so we have the video of it 
And what I'm putting together is a bonus for people who buy the book and pre-order. And if you do it off this podcast, just let me know if, if it's after the 17th, I'll make sure you get it. But um, it's, you get a copy of that video, which I think is worth its weight in gold, a MP3. So you get the audio and also the transcript from that presentation. So that's me bringing the book to life in front of people who have, you know, some of the people in the room, you know, are in hundred million dollar plus businesses. So, um, you know, it's, it's a whole other strata. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, excited about it. Uh, excited about it for the fact that's coming out. I'm unattached in the sense of saying, I don't make my living selling books, but I'm thrilled that I have a book and I can share this with the world. And uh, hopefully, you know, if you're watching this, you, you'll probably find the value in the book uh, to be pretty extraordinary. Absolutely. I'm excited for it. I will for sure be getting my uh, 1995 in there as well as my, uh, my uh, bonus uh, for pre-ordering. Uh, go, oh, today, man, just I go to gentempo.com to, you know, to get in and get, to get the order and the bonus, go to uh, gentempo.com easy enough. And, and all the information is right there. Yeah. And we'll drop that link in the, in the show notes and it's on the video. So, uh, Patrick, I can't, uh, I can't thank you enough for this. This has been, this has been a fun, like walk back down memory lane. And, uh, you're, like I said, you're one of my, one of my first mentors in chiropractic and I appreciate everything you've done for my career as well as tens of thousands of others. And I'm excited to watch uh, what's next. Thanks so much. It's really great to be with you. A lot of fun. And I hope we delivered some value today. Awesome. I'll see you next week in uh, Scottsdale. Looking forward to it. Take care. All right, man. I'll, t- I'll see you on the next one.